A spring morning shattered without warning. He waited for her. He shot her right straight in the face, and he killed her. They said a, a woman has been shot. A loving wife. To my horror, it was Janie. And devoted mother. I remember kind of just dropping to my knees at that point in time. The brutal murder so baffling, even seasoned investigators are running out of clues. There was never a reason that we could focus on, oh, this was the reason that she was killed. Nothing. The whole community was scared. This looked like a crime that was going to be very difficult to solve. Ten months later, another savage shooting with the same M.O. Lone male, black assailant. In the middle of the day, single shot to the face. A gruesome coincidence? This is not our guy. Or a serial killer on the loose? I was convinced I was missing something. Why did it happen? Where is he? I just wasn't putting the pieces together. What else can I do to try and find this guy? Two female investigators prepare to risk it all to bring the guilty to justice. My boss told me to let it go, but something about it kept grabbing at me. I just couldn't let it go. A 45-minute drive south from the hustle of Los Angeles lies the quiet bedroom community of Fountain Valley, a location favored by early settlers for its ancient artesian wells that offered clean, fresh water. The, the motto of the city is it's a nice place to live, and it is a nice place to live. The former agricultural community has become one of the wealthiest cities in America, a pretty and peaceful place for a family, like the Carvers. June 11, 1995, a sleepy Saturday morning. 48-year-old pharmacist Al Carver is slowly easing into his day, but his wife Janie is already on the go. She just got up and says, you know, I think I'll, I'll take a run this morning, and, and uh, and he says, uh, that's fine. I've got some bills to pay, and so stayed behind to do that. It was Al who had introduced Janie to jogging. The couple had even run marathons together. She was uh, shorter than I was, obviously, so she had to take more strides than I did. But she was tougher than I was in terms of uh, her stamina. On this morning, the 46-year-old mother of two is running her usual route through nearby Mile Square Park. A flight attendant since the age of 21, Janie spends much of her time in the air, which is why, on her days off, she likes nothing more than to have her feet on the ground, close to her sons Justin and his older brother Cliff. She was loving, she was reliable, but most of all, she was just really fun. A lot of positive energy, really, really, you know, vivacious and just a go-getter. She was truly a straight shooter. You always heard exactly how she felt. She had a little bit of the uh, Irish blood in her and had a lot of spunk, and uh, I think we all enjoyed that. She was very active with the boys in school and in, uh, in sports. She was athletic, and she truly did, had a lust for life. It is still early as Janie Carver heads for home. We wake up on a Saturday morning expecting it to be a, a, a normal day, I guess, and so I was at my desk drinking my coffee and uh, writing checks. No one notices the man in the white car parked close to the Carver's house. Unbeknownst to Janie, he is lying in wait for her. She is less than a block away as the killer moves to meet her. A neighbor hears her last frightened words. Janie said, no, please, no. The ruthless killer slips away as quietly as he came, while a horrified witness calls for help. 
911 emergency? Okay, calm down for me, okay? okay? Tell me what you saw. I saw, I heard a scream, I heard a shot, I turn around, I see somebody laying across the street and he has to take off. Okay, hold on the line for me, okay? okay. I was uh, drinking my coffee and I heard some uh, sirens. And so I, I went out to the street. I asked what happened, and uh, they said a, a woman has been shot. She was lying on her back, uh, not moving at all. And uh, to my horror, it was Janie. She had been shot just below the left eye, the bullet severing her spinal cord. Paramedics rush her to the nearby hospital. I can recall sitting on the sidewalk and just sitting on the sidewalk and, uh, you know, trying to, to, to ask myself, well, you know, what had happened and why has this happened and how can something like this happen? It's homicide investigator Kim Brown's job to find out. I received a call from my lieutenant that there had been a shooting and she'd been transported to the hospital. It was just so unusual. Broad daylight, 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Al returns home to break the gruesome news to their 14-year-old son. Justin was uh, sleeping. I just says, wake up, Justin. We, you know, we, we have to go. Uh, I have to go to the hospital. Your mother's been shot. And uh, so that's, you know, just horribly uh, alarming and, and, and scary. Eldest son Cliff is a state away attending university in Portland, Oregon. He just, uh, you know, he said, you know, Cliff, your mom's been shot. Um, you need to come home. Um, and I remember kind of just dropping to my knees at that point in time. The entire family is in a state of bewilderment and shock. They escorted me into the exam room uh, in which they were attending to Janie. And uh, it was pretty obvious that this was a devastating uh, shot. And so they gave me a few seconds to say my goodbyes. And then, uh, you know, they, uh, <clears throat> and that was it. She's dead. Flight attendant and mother of two, Janie Carver, is dead. Shot in the face at point blank range as she returns from a run through her Fountain Valley, California neighborhood. Her family is devastated. Within the, the course of uh, a minute, your, your whole life is uh, turned upside down. Even seasoned police are shocked by the brutal nature of the crime. When I got to the hospital, Jane had already been pronounced dead. There was still all the medical apparatus on her, but I saw the gunshot. I saw the, the entrance and the exit. It was right under the left eye. It was at fairly close range. Just the angle of the shot and everything in all appearances, the intention was to kill her. But who was the shooter? And why was Janie Carver the target? Kim Brown joins Detective Bob Mosley at the crime scene to search for vital clues. We had one shell casing that we had recovered. Uh, it was from uh, an automatic. It was probably a nine millimeter. But other than that, we had no other physical evidence at the scene. The remainder of the recovered items are Janie's, remnants of the final terrifying moments of her life. She had her sunglasses. Uh, they had been broken. There was her headphones. There wasn't much at the crime scene to go on. Police hope the now blood-soaked clothing she was wearing might offer up more. DNA, blood, any sort of transfer from the suspect. But the tests come up negative, leaving police with no leads. Officers canvass the Carver's Fountain Valley neighborhood for witnesses, while Detective Brown focuses in on those who knew Janie best. Commonly, this type of crime, it's close to home. So you have to look at everybody as a potential suspect, and you can't rule anybody out, whether it's husband, family, or friends. First, they interviewed me, and then I realized they will have to talk to Al, and they will have to see him as a suspect. Janie's husband, Al, is brought into the police station for questioning. You have to continue to work the case to a point where you feel that you can eliminate someone. 
While Brown interviews family and friends, the officers on the ground are trying to piece together the brutal event. Where she was shot is actually a street that is heavy as far as traffic wise. So we had some people that were actually in vehicles that also witnessed it. They tell police they saw a black man carrying a gun approach the jogger on the sidewalk. I just can't imagine what Janie's last moments were like, how terrified she was. According to witnesses at the scene, when they heard a gunshot. She falls to the pavement, and then he nonchalantly walks back to a car. One of the witnesses described it as a, a small, white, compact-type car. But getting a detailed description of the assailant's face is much more difficult. Someone had observed the suspect from the side, and that was it. Police create a composite drawing from the witnesses' descriptions. We did flyer campaigns. We had mailer efforts. We had over 100 volunteers that somehow knew of Jane Carver, were friends of Jane Carver, or relatives of Jane Carver. I think, in the end, passed out 250,000 flyers all over Orange County. Despite the community's best efforts, no one comes forward to identify the mysterious man. It's like, what else can we do? And I'm sure the police felt the same way. In fact, police were deeply troubled by Janie Carver's execution-style murder and frustrated by their inability to solve it. It's difficult when months go by and you still have a whodunit. Janie's family and friends have all been cleared as suspects in her death, with the exception of Al Carver. Why had the man who often accompanied his wife on her run not gone with her that particular morning? Could it be that he had reason to want her dead? You look at their financial background. We look at the marriage. You look at life insurance policies. We look at if there's any possibility of affairs. You look at any gain that anyone would have had from her death. It had become clear that there was no evidence linking L towards anything. And it doesn't mean that my coworkers believed it. Of course, the general public probably didn't think so. There's one last thing to do to eliminate Al Carver as a suspect, and that is to give him a polygraph. Police wire up Al Carver five long months after his wife's horrible death. It was the day before Thanksgiving, and, and uh, it was really upsetting for me that I would be subjected to a polygraph test. He passed the polygraph. He was not a suspect in his wife's murder. I just uh, had um, no idea of why anyone would want to kill Janie. The reward fund for information leading to the killer's arrest continues to rise. It grew to uh, $50,000 ultimately. And police hope the new face-on composite of Janie's killer will produce someone who can identify him. But with each passing day and no sign of an arrest, the Fountain Valley community grows increasingly impatient. It will make me angry that someone could do something so callous and get away with it. It would have made Janie angry. I know it would have. I thought about the case every single day. Why did it happen? Where is he? What else can I do to try and find this guy? Beloved wife and mother, Janie Carver, is shot at point-blank range as she jogs through her Fountain Valley neighborhood on the outskirts of Los Angeles. Months later, not only do police have no suspects in their sights, they have no motive for her murder. This just didn't happen in Fountain Valley. We didn't have this type of crime. A 40-minute drive from Fountain Valley lies the oceanside city of San Clemente, California. The picturesque community was once the site of President Richard Nixon's vacation home, and it remains renowned for its beautiful beaches and temperate climate. It is April 10th, 1996, nine months after the killing of Janie Carver. Businessman James Wengert parks his car in the garage of his downtown office building, oblivious to the armed man who is hurrying to intercept him. 
As the 48-year-old investment researcher makes his way toward the exit, the shooter moves into position, then just steps from the stairwell. Orange County Captain Christine Murray is called in to investigate the shooting, but the details are scarce. A businessman in San Clemente was being treated for a uh, gunshot wound to the face. By the time Murray reaches the hospital, there is good news. Unlike Janie Carver, James Wengert will survive. He had clearly suffered a significant injury to the side of his face, swollen in the jaw, the neck, and up to his eye socket. We were amazed he was alive. More amazing still, the injured man was able to go looking for help after outwitting his attacker. When Winger was shot, he dropped immediately to the ground and made a very quick decision that probably saved his life to just play dead and not let on that he had survived the shot to the head. James Wengert was smart, but he was also very lucky. The bullet struck a significant portion of a dental implant, bridge work, and it caused the bullet to fragment. The round did not penetrate into his brain. With the victim out of commission, Murray looks to the crime scene for clues. There was no video evidence, no independent witnesses of the event. And there was some blood evidence and a shell casing. Other than that, really very little to go on. At first glance, it appears to be a robbery turned violent. But the experienced investigator thinks otherwise. No one took his car keys. His office was nearby. His car was within just a few feet of where he had been shot. This looked like a crime that was going to be very difficult to solve. Murray decides to pay victim James Wingert another visit. This time, he is able to tell her that his assailant was a black male and a stranger. But it's what Wingert mentions next that most piques Murray's interest. He began to tell us about a business dealing that he had with a company called Premium Commercial and a very antagonistic relationship he developed with the owner, Cole Allen. Premium Commercial, headquartered in an Orange County strip mall, lends money to businesses short of cash. Murray learns that company owner Cole Allen is already under investigation by another police force. As we began to investigate Cole Allen and his business dealings, we started to encounter other law enforcement agencies that had dealt with him regarding assaults. He was a man in his uh, mid to late 50s. A uh, big frame man. He was an immaculate dresser, but he was very intimidating. He was verbally abusive to most of these people who had borrowed money from him. But police believe Allen was a lot more than just abusive. He would require the borrower to take a life insurance policy out, listing Cole Allen as a beneficiary. And those policies are well in excess of the money the borrower owes so that if they died, he would collect that money. But could Cole Allen have murdered clients in order to collect? And was that the plan for James Wengert? Murray learns Wengert owed Premium Commercial $200,000, but his life was insured for $600,000. Reason enough to bring Cole Allen in for questioning. We love an interview. You want to get someone in the chair and talk to them and see what they say. Cole Allen was certainly our primary focus. We wanted to talk to him. There's just one problem. Cole Allen died of a heart attack three days before James Wengert was shot. There was um, one of our first hurdles. This looked like a very good lead, but he had been dead. So if Cole Allen hadn't pulled the trigger on James Wengert, had he hired someone to do it before he died? We began uh, a very arduous process of examining his life and his business to see if we could identify who the shooter might be. Starting with an actual search of Allen's company. As well as multiple search warrants on every telephone that we knew he used. You start looking for common numbers, common names, or something unusual, a cash payment uh, without an invoice. 
10 months after the cold-blooded killing of flight attendant and mother of two, Janie Carver, Fountain Valley, California police haven't got a single lead. The whole community was scared. Uh, this didn't happen in our community, and if it could happen to Jane, it could happen to me. Unbeknownst to Brown and her fellow investigators, a similar execution-style shooting has just happened a 40-minute drive south in the town of San Clemente. But this time, the victim, businessman James Winkert, survives. We don't investigate a lot of cases where people are shot in the head and, and survive or are able to talk to us. Wenger tells police that he believes the man responsible for the attempt on his life is ruthless loan shark Cole Allen. Allen is already under investigation by another police force for a suspected sinister lending scheme. Cole made money by lending money the borrower couldn't pay back and then taking life insurance policies out on them, listing Cole Allen as a beneficiary. Police believe Allen was then having those borrowers killed and collecting on their life insurance, receiving well in excess of the money the client owed. But with Allen dead of a heart attack, police need a paper trail to prove their theory. And a search of his business, Premium Commercial, turns up no concrete evidence of any deadly conduct. I think it was frustrating for everyone that had been investigating Cole Allen. This was who you wanted to hold accountable for what had occurred. Then, just as Murray is running out of leads, she hears a casual remark that captures her attention. My lieutenant made a comment that the only time he could remember a black suspect shooting a white victim in Orange County was that case last year in Fountain Valley. And those similarities were a lone male black assailant, a single shot to the face in the middle of the day, and both victims were white. So could there be a link between Janie Carver's murder and James Wengard's attempted murder? Could Cole Allen have contracted both? Murray contacts Fountain Valley detectives. They readily met with me and were excited that there was just something new to discuss and hopeful that it might lead somewhere. Now we're starting to say, maybe this is our guy. And just maybe the reason Mr. Winkert was shot was the reason that Jane Carver may have been shot. But despite the similarities between the two cases, their hopes are soon dashed. Police can find no connection between Janie Carver and James Wengert or Cole Allen. I was disappointed, but the reaction of the Fountain Valley detectives was, was very difficult to watch. They were very disappointed. It's difficult when we have a high profile case and the case isn't solved. And you want everybody to know that you're really good at taking care of crime in your city. They wish me luck on my investigation and I wish them luck on theirs, uh, but we separated our cases and moved on. Now, both investigations are at a virtual standstill. It's very frustrating when you don't have workable leads, but I've also learned that Sometimes time is your, also your best weapon. Two weeks later, Murray's patience pays off big in the form of an unexpected phone call from an unlikely source. The Sheriff's Department was contacted by Cole Allen's widow and reported a male subject was claiming to have killed someone at Cole Allen's direction. It was apparent to us that the subject thought he had killed Wingert and he wanted to be paid. Finally, the break Christine Murray has been desperate for, evidence that Cole Allen had hired hitmen to kill his borrowers, including James Wengert. Fearing for her own life, Cole Allen's wife, Barbara, had hired a private investigator to deal with the unknown caller. Okay, you wanna meet the Home Depot parking lot? Sure, Home Depot parking lot, great. The P.I. had someone surreptitiously videotape his parking lot meeting with the caller. The guy identified himself as Paula Lean and said he was acting as a middleman for the actual killer of James Wingert. So just pay him the money and he would take care of making sure the bad guys went away. Christine Murray believes Paula Lean is Wingert's attempted murderer, not just a middleman. If I had killed someone, I'm not going to have other people go collect money for me. I'm just going to go get the money. 
Um, so none of that made sense. But for police to arrest Paula Lean, they'll need James Wenger to identify him as his shooter. Investigators include Aline's mugshot in a photo lineup and pay a late night visit to the victim's home. I believe it was around three in the morning and showed him the lineup. We were a little concerned that he might be sleepy or tired, but he was very, uh, very much awake. When you do these, a lot of times they'll, they'll touch the, the photograph. Number five, can identify photograph number five as the suspect? Yes. And he positively identified Paul Lane as the man who shot him. And on April 23rd, 1995, police arrest the unsuspecting Aline, then mount a search of his property. He was wearing certain clothing at the time of the crime. You look for that. There was a gun used, so you're looking for that. Police find only a gun cleaning kit and no link between Paul Aline and James Wengert. If the 29-year-old Aline is their hitman, he's not admitting to it. I told you, I never shot anybody in the face. I've never been a single man. He had initially told the private investigator that he was just the guy collecting the money for the shooter. I was just a little push around boy for call. But as the interview wears on, Aline slips up. He made the comment that all black men must look the same to an old white guy. And that struck an immediate chord with us as we had never described James Wingert to Paula Lean. And so the only way he would have known he was an old white guy was if he had, in fact, been the shooter. Orange County police have arrested Paul Aline, the man they believe was hired by loan shark Cole Allen to shoot San Clemente businessman James Wengert. Detective Christine Murray suspects there might be a link between Wengert's attempted murder and the brutal killing of Janie Carver 10 months earlier. But Fountain Valley police can find no connection. In his interview with investigators, Aline admits to knowing Cole Allen, but maintains he had nothing to do with the hit on James Wengert. I told you, I never shot anybody in the face. I've never been a single man. Aline insisted throughout the interview that he had shot no one, he was a, not a violent guy. But Aline incriminates himself by providing police with information only Wengert's shooter would know. And Christine Murray, having got the evidence she needs, leaves her partner to finish up the interview. Still, Murray can't shake the feeling that the Wingard shooting is somehow connected to Janie Carver's killing. I would say it was as a hunch, and, and you get these throughout your police career, and you don't want to rationalize things away. You want to, to prove them false or positive. The next day, she again contacts the Fountain Valley Police Department. We weren't sure what the connection was to Jane. All we had were the witnesses that came forward in the beginning. Christine Murray gave us a mugshot, which we looked at and go, mm, probably not. Aline's photo bears little resemblance to the composite of Janie Carver's killer. But just to be sure, we went down to Orange County Jail saw him in person, and we both kind of looked at each other and said, no, this is not our guy. It was frustrating. We had, through the Wingard investigation, been exposed to this web of evil. There was a thought that this evil was what had occurred in Fountain Valley and that, you know, maybe we would solve it. And having all those possibilities eliminated was very frustrating. A week goes by, and Murray is comparing the taped Paul Aline interview to the transcript to be presented at trial. You're looking for the, the nuances and the details in someone's words to fill in the blanks that the transcriber left. Close to the end of the tape, when Murray had left Mark Simon to finish up the interview. When's the last time you talked to us? Monday. And Paul Aline said something about Cole Allen being mad at Leonard or Leonard Monday for shooting the wrong person. We shot the wrong person once or something like that. I did not know anything about another crime that we were looking at. So at the time, I didn't think anything of it. And since Leonard Mundy is not a name known to police, Simon made a note of it and moved on. But Christine Murray is all ears. 
We shot the wrong person once. Or Leonard shot the wrong guy once. It was like, <laughs> well, wait a minute. I, who did he shoot? We've got to find out who that person was. Could it be Janie Carver? We shot the wrong person once. I had this sense that I was missing something, that I hadn't quite connected all the dots or put all the pieces together. Murray learns that Leonard Mundy is an electrician and father of two, hardly the profile of a cold-blooded killer. But if Mundy is not their murderer, can he help them solve the Carver killing? Murray needs to find him and find out. And so I began to look in other areas of Orange County, as well as the adjoining counties, Los Angeles in particular. But before she can make any headway, Murray's Orange County boss tells her that with the suspect in the Wingert shooting in custody, she needs to leave the Carver case to the Fountain Valley police. For Christine Murray, that's easier said than done. And it's hard to explain why something just keeps tugging at you. And so I didn't let it go. Working on the Janie Carver murder in her free time, Murray comes across a strange coincidence. Going through my notes and records, I realized that the Wingerts used to live in Fountain Valley. In fact, at the time of Janie Carver's murder, the Wingerts lived just a seven minute drive from the Carver's home. Could there be a connection? I decided I'm gonna drive by the Wingert house and take a look. Police believe that deceased loan shark Cole Allen hired hitman Paul Aline to kill businessman James Wengert. In his interview, Aline let slip the name Leonard Mundy, a man he says Cole Allen was angry with for having made a fatal mistake. We shot the wrong person once or something like that. I tried to get some of the details, but he didn't have any, only that Cole Allen was mad at Leonard for shooting the wrong person. When lead investigator Christine Murray learns of Aline's comment, she wonders whether Leonard Mundy might have also been hired by Cole Allen as a second hitman. We've got to find out who that person was. Can we link Leonard Mundy to a murder? And was the victim Janie Carver, the mother of two brutally murdered 10 months earlier? In her effort to connect the two cases, Murray decides to take a drive past James Wengert's former Fountain Valley residence. When I got off the freeway at Brookhurst to do that, I discovered that the freeway off ramps were a little confusing. Instead of a straight off, there was a big clover leaf. And when I got off the freeway, I found myself on Brookhurst, uh, heading in the direction that Jane Carver lived. A simple wrong turn off the highway has taken Murray north to the Carvers rather than off the Cloverleaf and south to the home of James Wengert and his wife. Had the man who killed Janie Carver made the same mistake? And if so, who was his real target? Again, I went back to the records and I discovered that James Wengert's wife was involved in a very contentious legal dispute with Cole Allen. Margaret Wengert was suing Cole Allen for threatening to foreclose on the Wengert's home in order to collect on the money James Wengert owed him. And that lawsuit had come to a head. Mrs. Wengert was due in court to testify against Cole Allen. And just a few days after Jane Carver was murdered. And so I began to think that maybe Margaret Wengert was the target of that shooting. And instead of shooting Margaret Wingert, someone shot Jane Carver. Both women frequented the park near their homes. Both were white and middle-aged. Were those similarities enough to further confuse the killer? Murray returns to drive the route. I did it again and again, and I got back on the freeway and went northbound and doubled back and got off the freeway again to see if my confusion was just because I wasn't paying attention or could someone not familiar with the area make the same mistake. It started making sense to me that if you got turned around but were following someone else's directions, you could have ended up where Jane Carver was shot when you meant to be at the Wingert house. Murray shares her startling mistaken identity theory with Fountain Valley detectives. 
When I heard all the theory and everything put together, it was the answers started coming. What was important is that it, it gave why he did and why he went where. But is he Leonard Mundy? Leonard Mundy's background was not a violent man, but an abuser of drugs and alcohol. Heavily into drugs, heavily into cocaine. Business was going bankrupt. Was he desperate enough to kill for Cole Allen and strung out enough to mistake Janie Carver as his target? With the loan shark dead, detectives need to find someone else from the lending company who will open up the books. Trouble is, police don't have a search warrant. So, <laughs> just decided to bogart our way in and see what happens. <laughs> Their visit to Premium Commercial unearths a clear paper trail between the lending company and hitman Paul Aline, hired to kill businessman James Wengert. But what Mosley and his partner can't find is any evidence of a link between the loan company and suspected hitman Leonard Mundy. Just as the investigators seem about to admit defeat, Mosley takes a final crack at getting a Premium Commercial employee to dig deeper. I ask him, is there another contract like Paul Lane's? And if not, I'll be back with a search warrant and I'll have an officer stay here until we find out. He went absolutely white. Sits back down in the chair. He says, well, in a whisper, I have been looking at the contracts and I found one. He goes to his bottom drawer, picks out a contract in the name of Mundy. Concrete evidence of a relationship between loan shark Cole Allen and Leonard Mundy, the man police believe killed Janie Carver. And attached to the contract, Detective Mosley and his partner spot a photograph of Mundy. And we both get a case of the big eyes. I know this is our guy. They include Leonard Mundy in a photo lineup and show that to their best eyewitness to Janie Carver's murder. But nearly a year after the shooting, can he still recall the killer's face? And is it Leonard Mundy's? Uh, later that afternoon, I was still at my desk and Bob Mosley called me on the phone. And Bob was crying. Bob said he picked him out. He picked him out. He picked Leonard Monday out. That's who killed Jane Carver. Yeah, we were both, both very, <clears throat> just very emotional. The following day, heavily armed police arrive at Leonard Monday's door. They did the knock, talk, arrest, search. It was all done in a minute and 30 seconds. The first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to see the person that was responsible for all the heartache and the grief that he caused to all the victim's family and friends in the community. Detectives have arrested Leonard Mundy, the man suspected of killing flight attendant and mother Janie Carver in a tragic case of mistaken identity. Mundy matches the composite drawing, but is he their man? Investigators interview him to find out. Why does he give you 30 grand? He gives me the money, I give it back. Yeah, but why? Mundy admits to knowing moneylender Cole Allen, but denies working as a hitman for him. I haven't shot anybody. That I can say with well, I, 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 I'd like to believe you, but I don't. Detectives on the case aren't buying it. There was a profile portion of the composite that I was struck by not only the hairline being very accurate, but also the shadows in the jawline. I showed him the composite. He said, yeah, that's me. I mean, he, he said, oh, yeah, that's me. And so that's when he started talking about, well, I want a lie detector test. I'll show you I didn't do it. Though not admissible in a court of law, a polygraph helps investigators know if they're on the right track. 
And according to the men who'd administered it. He came to me and says, you know, I seldom get one that is this positive. There's no doubt in my mind that this is your killer. Flunked it big time. It made everything seem worthwhile that I had done in the last few weeks. But their case could completely fall apart unless witnesses to Carver's gruesome murder identify Mundy in an in-person lineup. It's absolutely essential for court. We put Leonard in a lineup with five other men, all similar description. Each witness is given a, a slip of paper to secretly write down the person they identify if they're able to identify someone. Every one of them uh, independently picked out Leonard Monday as Jane Carver's killer. We finally have the person responsible for Jane's death. People were hugging one another, very congratulatory. But it also brought home a somber feeling about why we were there. And a lot of people began to express um, very heartfelt um, thoughts and memories about Jane Carver. Bob Mosley delivers the bittersweet news to Janie's husband. After, you know, wondering for many months, um, then uh, the day has finally happened, and uh, your, uh, your hope has finally uh, been realized. We both cried like hell. <laughs> I still get emotional from it. How can you not only kill someone, kill the wrong person? I, you know, I, how, how can anybody um, comprehend what happened? I think a uh, inept, inexperienced killer, under either the promise of money or the threats of Cole Allen, uh, went to Fountain Valley uh, to kill a woman, and he killed the wrong woman. It's sad. It's incredibly sad that. It had to happen at all. The court cases confirm that both Leonard Mundy and Paul Aline were hired to kill by Cole Allen in exchange for wiping out their debts to premium commercial. Paul Aline is found guilty of the attempted murder of James Wengert and sentenced to 29 years in prison. For the murder of Janie Carver, Leonard Mundy will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Cases solved. Jane isn't going to come back, but Jane, Jane's in everybody's heart and always will be. Lieutenant Kim Brown was honored by the Carver family for her part in finding Janie's killer. Captain Christine Murray received the Orange County Sheriff's Medal of Merit. I wonder if I hadn't gone southbound on that 405 freeway that day, if I would have ever said, put Leonard in a photo lineup. Yeah, I'll take luck any day. A popular teenager murdered on the grounds of an elementary school. She did absolutely nothing wrong. Then another woman is viciously stabbed. This guy could be a serial killer. The attacker, in his haste to get away, leaves a vital piece of evidence. In the laboratory, we, we call it Cinderella evidence. DNA connects the two assaults. But you need more than DNA. You need a name. Then another deadly attack linked to the same man. It's up to homicide detective Molly Dahl to track down this brutal killer before he strikes again. He's wanting to murder women. Across the bay from San Francisco lies the city of San Leandro, California, a city that has grown increasingly popular among young families for its small town feel and seaside setting. It's the evening of November 5th. A storm sweeps in, bringing torrential rain. At 8.30 p.m., patrol officer Jim Stark is dispatched to Jefferson Elementary School. 
An alarm that picks up both movement and sound has been triggered by a strange banging coming from the building. I responded, went and checked it out. Um, you know, walked the perimeter, checked the doors, make sure it was all secure, which it was. I decided to walk the school grounds itself just to make sure that we weren't missing something. When I got to the end of the, the buildings, I could see an umbrella that was upside down. It was open, it was collecting rain. As I rounded around the building, um, at that point I could see some clothing. Scattered across the yard, a pair of shoes and a jacket, an ominous trail to what he is about to discover. So I continued around the, the building. When I got to the corner of the building, I could hear a little banging sound. It wasn't real hard pounding, it was just very light, you know, but something that was methodical. So I peeked around the corner and that's when I saw the victim. A young woman lying beside the school wall. With her left hand, she was hitting the wall of the building, the exterior wall. She had been shot in the head. Officer Stark calls for an ambulance and police backup. As soon as I got off the radio, my um, raincoat went off and I put it around, you know, on top of her to cover her. Um, I uh, reached down, um, grabbed her hand, um, just to, you know, let her know, hey, help is coming. Paramedics rush the victim to emergency. Back at the crime scene, investigators, including lead detective Autry James, start the search for evidence. You know, if he'd have asked me the day before, had I seen everything, I would have told you, absolutely. There's nothing that's gonna surprise me or shock me at this point. But I gotta tell you, I was shocked. I was shocked at the level of violence involved. Detective Rick DaCosta is concerned the storm is washing away evidence. Any sort of shoe print, footprint, would more than likely have been either destroyed or would have been very difficult to identify at a later time. One of our folks that collects evidence they discovered a shell casing that was near where the umbrella was. So our assumption was that was where she was shot. And she had been dragged a uh, short distance. Using school ID, police identify the victim as 15-year-old Evelina LeBlanc, the immediately locator mother. I asked him what had happened, and he says, well, um, it wasn't uh, anything Evelina did. He said, uh, I think she probably was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I said, well, what do you mean? So he said, well, Evelina's been shot. Evelina was the apple of her mother's eye. She's like my best friend. Evelina was a very bubbly, bright, loving, outgoing, intelligent young woman. She was a good student. Uh, the type of person, if you met her, you'd never forget her. By the time Arlene arrives at the hospital, Evelina's on life support. And he told me that she had put up a struggle because she had had uh, her nails done and two of the nails had come off. But they had cleaned her and she looked like she was just asleep. So the doctor came in and he told me that uh, Evelina was not, <clears throat> was not, <sighs> was not gonna make it. The next morning with her mother at her bedside, Evelina is taken off life support. The case is now a homicide. Investigators get to work, searching for her killer. Initially, we didn't know if this was someone who knew Evelina, who was angry with her. We had no idea what the motive was. We didn't know if it was a jilted boyfriend. Police found a DNA sample on Evelina they believe is from the killer. They run it through the national database, but there's no match. Somebody who has this type of disregard for human life more than likely isn't gonna just do it once. Our hopes were that at some point, this person's DNA would be uploaded into a database and we would get some sort of hit on this person. Until then, they must rely on more traditional police work to find their killer. What we tried to do is to map out what her day was. Um, you know, from the very beginning when she woke up to the point when she was attacked. What we learned is, is that Evelina had been at one of the local high school's football games that day. Evelina decided she was gonna leave the game early. 
She just couldn't deal with the rain and the cold, so she left her friends and headed back using public transportation. We managed to find out which bus she was on, and from there, we were able to contact some individuals who were on the bus, and one of them was a bus driver. The driver recalls that after Evelina boarded, a young man started calling out to her. After a short period of time, the young lady got up, walked towards the back of the bus where this young man was, and they initiated a conversation. According to the driver, the two step off the bus together at approximately 6.30 p.m. And it looked as though to her that they were preparing to cross the street. Evelina gets off the bus only five blocks from where she's murdered. That was the last time that anyone recalls seeing her uh, alive. Could this young man, a teenager himself, be Evelina's killer? Or can he help lead police to the person who is? 15-year-old Evelina LeBlanc was brutally murdered in an elementary schoolyard. As police investigate the gruesome crime, a bus driver provides vital information. She saw Evelina step off the bus with a young man only two hours before the murder. That individual who got off the bus with Evelina was really the focus of our investigation. Police release a composite drawing based on the bus driver's description of the teenager seen with Evelina. A light-skinned African-American male, probably 15 to 17 years old, with a thin build and cornrow style haircut. Officers blanket San Leandro with flyers in the hope witnesses will come forward. Then they begin the arduous process of trying to identify potential suspects at Evelina's high school. We talked to so many kids, so many adults that knew Evelina, just trying to establish who could be this angry with her, who could have this sort of venom inside of them. The goal was is that every contact she made, we wanted to speak with that person who she made that contact with, because they either were a suspect or someone who was going to lead us to a suspect. Since police have DNA from Evelina's attacker, they hope to find him by matching his genetic profile to someone she knew. There were actually search warrants written for the collection of DNA evidence from some males in the area, some students, and some non-students. With the use of DNA, uh, we were able to exclude people who were within her circle that necessarily didn't have an alibi. Unfortunately, we never got a match. In addition to not finding a DNA link, no one recognizes the composite. We were never able to identify who the individual was that got off the bus with Evelina. The frustration level was very high for our agency because this was such a devastating crime. The unsolved crime is also devastating for Evelina's mother. I was very angry. I wanted him captured. I wanted the person captured that, you know, had taken her life. Despite investigators' best efforts, it seems Evelina's savage killer will escape justice. As some of these cases go, unfortunately, the weeks turn into months, the months turn into years, and before you know it, it becomes a cold case. Flash forward 13 years. The cold case murder of Evelina LeBlanc is about to heat up, but in another state. It's a cool March night in Portland, Oregon. 35-year-old Elena Thompson is walking home. I was coming from playing a video poker. Ran to this guy, and he was coming from around a truck, crossed the street. As the man approaches her, he introduces himself, but she can barely understand his name. It sounds like Nani or Naji. He asked me, was I from the islands? I told him I wasn't from the island. And um, he is temper went sky high. So I lied and said, okay, yeah, I'm from the islands. I was just playing with you, you know? So he came back down to his normal self. There's something off with this strange man. I kind of uh, got away from him and ran across the bridge. And I looked back and I didn't see him anymore. But I still thought and felt somebody was following me. He pops up on a blue bike and I said, you need to stop following me. 
I lied to him and told him the police has followed me. I just got into it at a bar and um, he said, no bitch, I'm following you. He jumps off his bike. We fight. He pulls out some out of his pocket. At that time, I didn't know what it was, but I heard a click. This was a fisher knife. He stabbed me in my arms, in the top of my head, and he kept saying his God told him to. I felt blood, warm blood. It was just like coming down my face. That one to the head was like life threatening. As the attacker goes to stab her again, he's interrupted. And it's like this guy came down with a skateboard, put a skateboard down in the middle of the street, rushes over. This guy who stabs me, runs and get his bike and runs off. Elena's savior races to get her help. By the time I got to the hospital, through the doors, they said I had five more minutes to live. I lost a lot of blood. After I woke up, I seen the pictures they took, and one of the pictures really scared me because my eyes was taped down like I was in a morgue. When police arrive at the scene of the stabbing, they find a vital piece of evidence. Alina's vicious attacker lost his shoe. The shoe is sent to forensic scientist Janelle Scott at the Oregon State Crime Lab. Believe it or not, shoes are left behind at the scene of the crime quite a bit. In fact, in the laboratory, we, we call it Cinderella evidence. But shoes aren't a great source of DNA. If you think of a shoe, it has very little direct contact with the skin itself. So for example, I would expect a good profile from the back of your shirt that rubs on your neck. Um, shoes generally are separated from your skin by socks. It's a long shot, but with no other evidence left at the scene, police hope DNA will identify this violent criminal. And there's good news, sort of. So we swabbed the shoe, and we obtained a partial profile from it, which means there wasn't a lot of DNA there, but it was enough information to search it against our database. Elena Thompson was savagely stabbed as she walked home late one March night in Portland. She survives, but the attack leaves her terrified. I was uh, scared because they haven't caught up with him. I was scared to go places, you know, I don't like people sitting behind me. I don't like crowds, I don't go shopping anymore unless I'm with my brother. I just He just changed me. When her attacker fled, a vital piece of evidence was left behind, his shoe. And even though shoes aren't usually a good source of DNA, forensic scientist Janelle Scott manages to extract some. We got a partial profile uh, because there wasn't a lot of DNA left behind. That partial profile was added to the database. Even more remarkable, the DNA found on the shoe matches DNA from another crime scene altogether. We found out that that profile matched to a profile left behind at a homicide from 1994 in California. She has just linked two vicious crimes, the unsolved murder of high school student Evelina LeBlanc and the attempted murder of Portland resident Elena Thompson. That the DNA profiles were from the same person was astonishing. San Leandro detective Rick DaCosta is contacted about the match. My heart started beating faster. My first thought was, I can't wait to let Arlene know that we may one day solve this case. I just didn't give up hope. I just kept uh, praying and saying, you know, eventually the person will be caught. Although DNA has linked these sadistic crimes, that's all it can do. So your DNA profile is a series of numbers, but they don't tell us anything about you, except if you're male or female. DNA won't tell investigators who the person is. It doesn't tell us their name, any, their height, any physical characteristics, or any sort of ethnic background. So science had done all it can do, and it was now up to Portland police to put a name with these crimes. 
it falls to homicide detective Molly Dahl to find the killer connected to these unidentified DNA samples. I had been in homicide less than six months, and yeah, I felt the pressure. You don't just go through life and do one violent crime. This is definitely somebody that was prone to do it again. She believes he's committed more crimes since these attacks. It fits the profile of someone that's doing this. There's no reason for him not to stop doing it because he's been getting away with it for so many years. She examines the DNA reports, but it's what she does next that really hooks her. When I started pulling up pictures of Evelina LeBlanc, that gave me a face that just made me think of one word, innocence. And after I saw Evelina's face, it wasn't just some innocuous crime lab report. Now, Dahl wants to meet with Elena Thompson, the one person to have seen the killer face to face. I need to get out of her the small details that didn't perhaps make it into a police report from the original interview. They begin with the attacker's appearance. She said he was a male black, early 20s, medium build, around 5'8". Dark, slanted eyes, um, very short hair. A description Dahl believes matches the composite sketch of the last person seen with Evelyn LeBlanc. Dahl continues to question her witness. And Eilina has a wonderful memory of that night, even though she should clearly be traumatized and may have blocked out some. Elena is able to provide a new lead about her attacker. She recalls him introducing himself. She wanted to think that this guy called himself Naji or Nani, something similar, something foreign sounding. At the hospital, I can remember nothing but nah. I said nah something, I told the officers, nah something. Elena asks her friends for help. She describes her attacker to them in hopes they can identify him. They said that's not G. And he hangs downtown. I wanted to run back to my desk and I wanted to start researching this name, Naji. I had a name. There can't be a lot of Najis running around Portland, so I'm thinking I'm golden right now. I can do this. Portland investigators are hunting for a vicious criminal who murdered Evelina LeBlanc and tried to kill Elena Thompson. I'm blessed to see another day. But I'm still afraid. Elena knew that night that this guy was going to kill her. DNA from the two attacks is matched to the same man. The two profiles were linked together, but we still didn't have a name to go with them. Alina, with help from friends, provides two possible names for her attacker. She told me his name was Naji or Nani. Alina's friend was being released from prison when she met a man with that name. And one of her girlfriends said, I know. I know the Naji you're talking about. He looks the same as you describe him. I was being transported to be released on the jail bus with Naji. Detective Dahl requests the log from the prison transport bus. I came up with a short list of about three possibles, three black males that had some similar physical characteristics. And when I looked at their names, there was no Naji. There was Nothing similar, not even a, an N name. But Dahl is determined to identify the killer. She digs into these three men's police records. The second guy, ordinary sounding name, but when you looked at his aliases and his monikers, there he was. I, I found Naji. I found Naji. And I am thinking, this is our guy. Actually, it felt good because they had an idea of who they was going to go get, who they was looking for. Um, one part of me felt relieved, and one part of me was still scared because they hadn't actually got him. Dahl just needs the crime lab to confirm Najee's DNA matches the genetic profile found at the crime scenes. 
to have somebody to compare the crimes to, a name to see if this was the person, was exciting. Dahl also puts together a photo lineup with Najee's picture for her eyewitness. Then I rushed back to Eilina. They sat me at the table and she had some papers and she was like, do you know any of these people? She took a quick scan of all six of those photos and Eilina said, he's not in here. And then my heart kind of dropped a little bit and said, hey, junior homicide detective, slow down. Even though Alina failed to identify Naji as her attacker, Dahl isn't giving up on this suspect. Witnesses can always be fallible. It's unreliable unless you have a bunch of witnesses saying the same thing. Besides, she knows it's DNA science that will prove whether Naji attacked these women. Janelle Scott called me and said, no, this Naji, his DNA did not match any of our cases. This is the worst news Dahl could receive. She's no closer to stopping her killer, and lives are in danger. So I was back to square one, and I felt the time crunch. It was bothering me that he was still walking around, um, doing his evil things, and that, really, why wouldn't he attack another woman? A state away in California, Time also haunts Arlene LeBlanc. Even though 13 years have gone by, she hopes one day her daughter's killer will be found. I would talk to her picture and then, you know, whenever I felt like she might have been there, I would let her, you know, let her know. We're not, we're still working on it and he will be caught. I'm not gonna give up. You know, I kept a picture of Evelina on my desk, under my blotter on my desk, I mean, it was a constant, it was a constant presence for me. It hit home with all of us. And we all couldn't imagine the pain again that Arlene uh, must have gone through, still goes through to this day. In Portland, Detective Dahl is also struggling. I was disappointed. I did find Najee, but Najee did not kill Evelina or attack Eilina. With no real leads or suspects, she hopes she can track her killer through police records. So I decided to start with compiling a list of recent arrests within that geographic area in Northeast Portland. So I had a crime analyst help me start capturing a list of subjects of the same physical description that had been arrested in that area. The amount of information is daunting, but Dahl is determined. I knew it was a long, long list, and it was going to take some time to make these lists a lot smaller. The probability that he was going to be on one of these lists is good. He's in the small part of the city of Portland. He's walking around. He's still out there. A young woman is killed, another brutally attacked. Both crimes are linked by DNA to the same man, but with no name attached to this evidence, police are scrambling to identify him before he attacks again. I could feel him at the tips of my fingers. It was, he was that tangible to me and it bugged me. So DNA is lovely, yes, but you need more than DNA. You need a name. As Detective Molly Dahl searches for this elusive killer, a seemingly unrelated assault will take a bizarre turn right into Dahl's investigation. It's a miserable night in Portland when a driver spots a woman lying at the side of the road. I'm a tow truck driver. I just pulled up onto a scene. Uh, I can tell you right now it's serious. There's a lot of blood. Detective Lynn Courtney is assigned to the case. When the officers found Charbetti, she was still alive, labored breathing, obvious trauma throughout her body, uh, especially in the head area. Soon after being rushed to the hospital, Charvetta Brown, a mother of two, dies from her extensive head injuries. At the autopsy, the medical examiner informs prosecutor Susan Howard that there are indentations in Brown's skull. She took one look at Charvetta Brown's body and looked up at me. She said, you know, I've seen this before. It's likely a hammer. 
this woman, Charvetia, had died pretty violently. It makes you feel pretty sick to your stomach, knowing that, you know, this is how someone died, you know, by being bludgeoned to death with a hammer to the head. Like Evelina's murder 13 years earlier, the night storm creates problems for the investigation. Evidence such as blood evidence, uh, that would have been washed away. Or uh, again, uh, any kind of impressions at the scene, footprints, tire impressions, that would have an impact on uh, the rain on evidence. In an effort to find a much needed lead, Courtney searches all the night's 911 reports. He spots a call just minutes before Brown was discovered. We learned that uh, a witness eight blocks away had called police earlier that same morning. Charvetia was found. 911, we have a very severe beating going on on my street right now. How many people are fighting? Two. That man is beating the crap out of a woman. She is screaming her lungs down. She gave us a description of a white pickup truck with a matching white canopy. And it, it was a white vehicle, I want to say like a Chevy S10 with a canopy on it. Police respond to the 911 call. By the time they got there, nobody was around. Uh, they checked the area. Uh, they couldn't find a victim. They didn't find this white pickup truck. So they cleared the scene. Later, with the advantage of daylight, Detective Courtney identifies items strewn on the ground. We found some things that looked like they might belong in a, a purse. And so we believe that he moved her once he started the beating, that he put her back in the truck and then dumped her there. If so, Courtney's best lead is the description of the pickup, and experience tells the veteran investigator it's probably stolen. I was just looking for white trucks on the hot sheet. It didn't specify if these trucks had a canopy or not, so I was just going through looking for white pickup trucks that had been recovered recently or stolen recently to see if there was anything unusual about the truck. He finds a stolen pickup and an owner whose vehicle is returned with more than she wants. When she got it back, she noticed there was some blood inside the truck. Uh, there was some bloody uh, tissues in the truck. It appeared to her that somebody had tried to wipe blood out from inside the truck. We found Charvetta's blood in this white truck that had been stolen. In addition, the owner of that pickup truck told us one of the things she was missing was a claw hammer that was in the cab of her truck. The killer drove this truck the night of the attack, but police are no closer to finding him until a friend of Charvetta Brown's comes forward, who was with her before the horrific assault. She actually contacted the detectives and told them, uh, I was with Charvetta and an unknown black male. We were driving around together in a white truck. I had a bad feeling about what was going on. I didn't like the guy. I got out of the truck and just went home. She gave us a name of Emoni or Imoni, Amoni, something like that. Courtney runs the names for matches. The database I was using works on the phonetic sound of a name. So if you type in uh, Emoni, for instance, you'll get several variations of that name that could possibly be Emoni or something similar. He gets back two unusual names. An Emoni came up and a Imani came up. Is it possible Courtney has found Charvetta Brown's killer? We pursued both names and did some further checks to either eliminate or identify one or the other as a suspect. As he works the names, Detective Dahl sits nearby, examining police records in a last ditch effort to find her killer. I still had a great physical description and I had his DNA. And I was just starting to go through that list, tooth and comb. The police bureau's cozy working conditions help detectives make an astounding connection. We are in an office with low partition, so there's not many secrets in our office. You can't help but overhear what uh, one another are doing or talking about. And I heard Detective Courtney had found a possible name of his suspect. And I started to listen harder. It went from e-money to e-money. And we all talk about that light bulb moment. And what I remembered was Eilina saying, Naji or Nani. And then I just heard the name Amani, Nani. 
Detective Molly Dahl is in a race to stop a violent criminal who attacked Alina Thompson in Portland and killed Evelina LeBlanc near San Francisco. I felt the pressure. This guy is murdering women. He's wanting to murder women. Sitting a few feet away, her colleague Lynn Courtney works on what seems to be an unrelated case, the murder of Charvetta Brown, a mother of two from Portland, Oregon. I'm letting my partner know what names I found in this database as possible suspects, and Detective Molly Dahl heard me mention the name Imoni and Imani, and she stood up and said, wait a minute, this sounds like the suspect in my case. I wasn't interested in Imani. I was interested in Imani, and I flew on the keyboard with his name, and when I pulled up his criminal background, I saw a series of arrests in the 1990s in the Oakland Bay Area, and I smiled. And I smiled to myself, and then I smiled for Evelina and her mother and Eilina. This man, Imani, was living in the same area where teenager Evelina LeBlanc lived at the time of her murder. Is he responsible for her death? and the two attacks on women in Portland. She then takes the name and checks to see what his criminal history is here in Oregon, and she can see that he's been convicted of a felony. And any felony, any person convicted of a felony, you have to get your cheek swabbed uh, for the DNA we entered into our database. Since Imani has done time for robbery, a felony, his DNA should be in the system. Detective Molly Dahl turns to the crime lab. Imani Williams' sample had been collected, but it hadn't been analyzed. It was waiting in a freezer for us to get to it. Of course I asked her to put a rush on it. The sooner I can get this information, the better it's gonna make a lot of people feel. Dahl's work moves Imani's DNA profile into the fast lane. To put it in perspective, Imani Williams' sample was one of over 30,000 waiting for analysis. It could have been anywhere between a year to two years before his sample would have been added if it hadn't been for Detective Dahl giving us his name. While the DNA is processed, Dahl puts together a photo lineup for Elena Thompson, the one woman to survive an attack by this cold-blooded assassin. Eilina very systematically looked at each one of the pictures. I said, do you recognize any of these? And it was like, that's him. I wanted to jump up and say, I, f I found my guy, but I didn't want to get my hopes up anymore. I didn't want people to say, you know, oh, Molly's crying wolf again. I wanted to be sure this time. Two days after overhearing the uncommon name, Dahl receives the forensic news of a lifetime. So I called Molly, and she was waiting, of course, anticipating the phone call. And she said, it's him. It's a match. Amani Williams' DNA matches Evelina LeBlanc and Eilina Thompson. The DNA link confirms it. Detective Dahl has identified the callous criminal who committed these crimes. That is the ultimate part of my job. He's arrested on a downtown street and charged with the two crimes he committed in Portland, the first degree assault of Alina Thompson and the murder of Charvetta Brown. This guy has been hurting women for many years, so I felt good. And I wanted to tell the people that mattered most. And so I got on the phone immediately to Sergeant Rick to Costa down in California in San Leandro. And this was the phone call I'd been waiting to make. That was the greatest phone call I've received in related to law enforcement in the 20 years I've been doing this. Just the day before, the image of Evelina, the picture that I had on my desk flashed into my mind. I mean, just out of nowhere, it was weird. And then the next day, we found him. That felt good. Thirteen agonizing years after Evelina LeBlanc was murdered in California, San Leandro detectives are about to confront Imani Williams, 
who is now in custody for his two Portland crimes. I think that Mr. Williams was caught completely by surprise when my partner and I went up to Portland. Does the name uh, Evelina LeBlanc ring a bell with you at all? No? Never heard that name before? You're positive? Yes, that was the honest answer. You're about to say something else. No. That was what? You said it was a long time ago. That's my honest answer. Did you already know her from before? Was she an acquaintance or a friend of a friend, or you just met her that night? Are you going to stare at the table all night, or are you going to tell us about it? Imani's not talking, but his crimes speak for themselves. Given his violent nature, I think he's the type of criminal that wouldn't have stopped. You stick this oral swab just in your mouth, mm -hmm. on the inside of your cheek, you make that kind of okay? You do that 10 times. A final DNA sample is conclusive proof. Imani Williams is the man responsible for these horrific crimes. I was excited because the same DNA was left behind at each of these scenes, and that same DNA profile came from Imani Williams' mouth. Everybody was happy, and it was a sense of relief. You're asking me what do I think about the DNA business? Yeah. DNA is DNA, bro. I really can't say. It's hard to dispute that, huh? So it's not a question of did you or not. I already know the answer to things. What we need to talk about here in the next few minutes are going to be some of the most important minutes for the rest of your life, OK? It's not a question of did you. The question is why and the circumstances. The keenly focused work of Portland detective Molly Dahl put a madman behind bars. It felt wonderful. I mean, that's that's the pinnacle of an investigation. Yeah, I, I caught a killer. With the help of Janelle Scott's DNA work, Dahl connected deadly attacks on three women in two different states. In the end, the DNA was a link that crossed state lines. But without Molly Dahl, it wouldn't have a name to go with it. She is the one who did the investigative work that linked these crimes truly to one individual. His name is Imani Williams. God does not go like me, man. I've, I've been in so many sinful things, bro. Charvetta was beaten in the head with what we believe to be a hammer. Uh, and Eilina Thompson was stabbed in the head. Uh, you have the victim down in California being shot in the head. In all three instances, he went for the woman's head. Is that what you're telling us? That, man, you know, this didn't bother you a bit? And it never, it never kept you awake at night? Looking into his eyes, it was very cold, almost inhuman. He would answer our questions, but it's almost like he didn't have a care in the world. Only Elena Thompson survives this savage killer. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm real blessed. But I could have been one of those who he have killed. Due to Dahl's tenacity, he's off the street. My only regret was that I didn't find his name until after he'd killed Charvetia. Dahl conclusively proved Imani killed Charvetta Brown and tried to kill Elena Thompson. He pleads to murder and first degree assault and is sent to prison. So he ends up doing a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 30 years. You know, if I'm still alive, I'll be at that parole board hearing uh, and we will, you know, make sure that he stays in. Are you that much of an animal? Once an animal, always an animal. Even more disturbing is the fact that Williams was very young when police believe he started killing. And I feel like there was something in his wiring that was wrong because we surmised based on the evidence that he killed Evelina LeBlanc when he was 14 years old. 
Because Imani was a juvenile back in 1994 when Evelina was murdered, it's the one case for which he can't be tried. You can't prosecute him, he's outside the jurisdiction of the court. If he had been tried and convicted of this unspeakable act, he would have been sent to the California Youth Authority until the age of 25. Well, by the time we talked to Mr. Williams, he was already 29 years old. After all these years, Evelina LeBlanc's mother will not get the justice she deserves. That Arling was not going to be able to go into a courtroom and look him in the eye and speak whatever words she wanted to him to confront him. I was severely disappointed. That's the one thing I wanted to ask. Why did you do it? We know who did it. We can actually close the books on that case. It was a big deal to me that, that this person was found. You know, I feel better. It, it, not just for me, but for Arlene. I mean, just imagine what she's gone through all these years. Arlene does find some solace in the prison term Imani is handed for his other monstrous crimes. It was really like a weight that was, you know, lifted. At least I know that he would not be able to hurt anyone else. At least he was, you know, behind bars. I can't give this family back their loved one. I can't erase the pain and the grief, but I can give them that little bit of closure. And that is the best part of my job. Amid sunny orange groves, a dark cloud falls upon a rural family home. A 41-year-old mother is struck down by crippling illness, suddenly and swiftly. Her hair was gone. She weighed probably 90 pounds. Within days, two of her teenage boys are also in critical condition. Doctors find the family has been poisoned with a lethal chemical, thallium nitrate. It's a heavy metal that is not used in many things. It was a band rat poison. Interferes with everything in your body, gets in your brain, and there's no way to get it out. When death claims a victim, a massive investigation is triggered. To murder somebody by poisoning is exceptionally rare. It is something that has to be thought up. A very demented mind. This is no ordinary killer. Most diabolical criminal I had ever seen. He was a very evil very devious person. A seasoned detective goes undercover at a murder mystery weekend devised by the suspect. One slip could cost her her life. I really took a deep breath and thought, has he seen me? He's not going to get in your face. He's going to poison you so that you die a slow, painful death. Drive far enough along Highway 60 into the heart of Central Florida, and you'll hit Alturas, a town of 500. Citrus groves outnumber people, 20 to 1. And there are lakes as far as the eye can see. Keep driving, and you'll come to a large clearing by the road, and a home where waitress Peggy Carr is beginning a new life. 41-year-old Peggy has spent many years as a single mom raising three children, Jelena, Alan, and Dwayne. We've seen all the heartbreak that she had, you know, gotten in her life that just made us more protective over. My relationship with my mom was um, a great relationship. Um, we uh, were very close, and that was very important to me. Um, she, was, um, she was exceptional. I just never seen my mom really in a bad mood. You know, she was always just full of life, it seemed like. Peggy's kids are thrilled when their mom meets Pie Carr, a phosphate miner. Here comes, you know, her knight shining armor. I was glad of their relationship. I was hoping that Pie was going to be the one. After a whirlwind courtship, Peggy and Pie tie the knot. I can remember she would 
tend to glow when she was that excited, that happy. And um, I thought it was um, a marriage made in heaven uh, for her. The couple has five kids between them, plus Peggy's granddaughter. They all move into Pais Alturas' home. Everybody seemed to really uh, get along well. My mother was happy, and she had the things that me and my brother always thought she deserved. Living in Alturas was great. We thought it was a, a paradise. But only six months after the wedding, trouble is brewing for Peggy and Pi. As the months went by, I started noticing my mom and him arguing more. On October 20th, Pi leaves on a hunting trip. Peggy stays at home with the kids and works some shifts at the restaurant. Three days later... She come home, she was having chest pain. She was talking about how bad her feet were hurting. I mean, they were just excruciating. And I was like, Mom, your feet always hurt, you know? You're, you're a waitress. And she's like, no, no, my feet are hurting. Within half an hour, Peggy is vomiting and in so much pain she can barely move. Pi returns home from his trip and his reaction shocks Peggy's son, Dwayne. Pi didn't want to take her to the hospital. Unable to convince Pi, Dwayne turns to his sister for help. I specifically remember my sister saying, no, I'm taking her, I'm taking her to the hospital. He's like, no, 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 just, it's flu, it's a flu, it'll, it'll pass. Late that night, Pi finally relents. I physically picked her up out of bed because she couldn't walk and carried her to my sister's car because she was in agonizing pain. Doctors run a battery of tests. And couldn't find anything and released her. You know, she's still in agonizing pain. They give her some sort, sort of pain medication. Within three days, Peggy is back in the hospital, this time in the intensive care unit. She kept on getting worse and worse and worse. The doctors are baffled by her deteriorating condition, and whatever it is seems to be contagious. Both Dwayne and his stepbrother, Travis, are rushed to the hospital. We were both throwing up, super dehydrated. I never could eat anything. The pain that I had was unbearable. It was like a thousand needles just wrapped around your foot. Despite the pain, Dwayne's bigger worry is his mom. I remember waking up in the hospital, hysterical, what's going on? Where's mom at? Is she okay? Dwayne is wheeled up four floors to visit Peggy. He's unprepared for what he sees. Her hair was gone. She weighed probably 90 pounds. They had a cap on her. They didn't want to give me the shock of my life to see her laying there. She was able to write on a notepad, my feet hurt, my feet hurt. Dwayne's brother, Alan, has been away serving in the Navy. He takes a leave to be with his family. When I walked in and first seen mom, um, I hardly recognized her. Uh, she was real pale. Of course, there were tubes and things um, all over. And uh, I don't think that mom understood what was going on. Coming home to that was a shocker. Within a week, Peggy falls into a coma, and Dwayne and his stepbrother show no signs of improvement. There wasn't much that could be done, and we just had to pray. Doctors desperately seek the cause of the illness. Tests for common environmental contaminants are negative. They pursue a more radical possibility and make a startling discovery. In the bucolic town of Alturas in rural Florida, there's been a tragic turn of events for the Carr family. Struck down by sudden illness, Peggy is in a coma while her son and stepson are both fighting for their lives. I honestly thought I was gonna die. Doctors run every conceivable test and finally arrive at a shocking conclusion. I remember they said, yes, we know what happened. You've been poisoned. We were like, what? Poisoned? What do you mean? Did we eat something bad? The news is infinitely worse. Peggy and the boys have ingested an obscure and deadly substance, the heavy metal thallium nitrate. They said it was a band rat poison and colorless, tasteless. Was this poisoning simply a tragic accident or a more sinister crime? The sheriff's office is determined to find the answer. Certainly in the beginning, murder was not on our mind at all. But we knew something was obviously wrong. How did these people ingest? How did they touch? How did they inhale? I mean, we truly didn't know in the very beginning how this all came about. 
Susie Shottlecott, a local reporter, catches wind of the story. There was definitely a fear in the community and a concern. People were worried that their groundwater was contaminated. We checked the well water, think there was more than one house on that particular well. No one else was suffering any problems. Tests confirm the well is not the problem. Now they're going to determine what the source of that thallium was so they could put out an alert to everybody who lived in that area. We were looking at every possibility. Prosecutor John Aguero joins the investigation. With all of the groves we have is thallium in some sort of grove spray, insect control, whatever it might be. So they had to research all of that. From there, we asked the authorities, what are you doing? What they were doing was examining everything in the car household. We thought that it was something that they had probably eaten, something they had drank. The sheriff's office swabs hundreds of items searching for the source of the contamination. They pretty much scoured the house from front to back. We found the Coca-Cola bottles had been tampered with, and someone had ultimately put thallium in the bottles and replaced the top. Coke laced with the odorless and tasteless thallium. This could be a case of product tampering and the beginning of a nationwide catastrophe. They had people down here who were scared to death to drink Coke. An investigation is launched. The initial step was to look at the bottling company and see what could have happened there. The Coke bottles don't come off one at a time and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're in a huge bunch of bottles that come down this thing and there's no way for it to have been contaminated at the plant and then end up with all eight bottles having thallium in them. That's just not possible. It turned out it was product tampering, but it was at the home. It was not at the store or at the site of where they make Coca-Cola. It appears this was a targeted attack, a deliberate attempt to poison the family with a highly toxic chemical. Alan, Peggy's eldest son, is outraged. I didn't know who or how, other than it was um, a deliberate poisoning. Right away, I wanted somebody to pay for it. But who was responsible? When you start an investigation, everybody's a suspect you have to rule out suspects. And certainly when Peggy was very sick and Pi didn't appear to be, obviously you think of him. But only six months into the marriage, could Pi Carr have a motive for poisoning his bride? Police learned that Peggy and Pi's relationship was rapidly deteriorating. I, I think he treated my mother horrible. I think he cheated on her. I don't think he was there enough. Just days before Pi left to go hunting, Peggy stayed with her kids in a local motel. I couldn't see that care and that concern in, in Pi. I mean, my mom was in the hospital. I don't remember him ever shedding a tear, ever, not one time. Dwayne tells the police he fears the worst. I thought that he poisoned my mother because he wanted out of the marriage. Pi Carr has a possible motive, and because he works in mining, he has access to this restricted chemical. Prosecutor John Aguero researches thallium poisoning. There are like hardly any reported cases of anybody using thallium. It's a heavy metal that is not used in many things. I, I'd never heard of it. Police bring Pi in for questioning, but they're thrown a curveball when Pi hands them a note he claims is from the real poisoner. I'm the one that got it from the mailbox, so I'm inquisitive as so I open it and uh, out comes this post-it that said, you and all your so-called family have exactly two weeks to move out of the state of Florida or you will all die. This is no joke. It's addressed to Pi Carr with Pi's unique name spelled correctly, which John Aguero finds significant. Had this note that was written to Pi Carr, P-Y-E, it's not spell it like a piece of pie. To write it like that was unusual. And whoever wrote this note knew that. Brought it inside. My mom immediately, you know, didn't think it was near as funny as I thought it was. You know, the kids were laughing and giggling and, uh, oh, it's just somebody. It's just somebody down the street. She, uh, no, I'm taking it to the police. And she was very upset about it. But Peggy never takes the note to the police. Instead, it's shoved in a kitchen drawer. But why did Pi wait until now to bring the note up with the police? Is he trying to shift the focus away from himself? Her husband was a suspect, Pi Carr, obviously. Surprisingly, tests reveal Pi has thallium in his body, though he has not fallen ill. Pi was a suspect, but he had some of the coke himself. 
He could have taken a small dose to throw detectives off, but it turns out that almost everyone in the household drank some of the poison Coke, even if they haven't gotten sick. Is Pie Car the wrong man? A sunny rural Florida town is the site of a dark and twisted crime. Soft drinks laced with thallium nitrate have been planted in the Carr family home. Peggy Carr's in a coma, and her son and stepson are fighting for their lives. Son Dwayne thinks his mom's new husband, Pie Carr, is responsible. I really thought that Pa done it. Though Pie has been the prime suspect, some things don't add up. The whole family, including Pie, drank the poisoned Coke. Everyone in the house had thallium in their system. And months before the poisoning, the family had received a threatening note that suggested they were all targets. Exactly two weeks to move out of the state of Florida, or you will all die. Reporter Susie Shottlecott learns from the police that the poisoning of the car's household may not have been the first. Two of the car dogs died suddenly within a couple weeks of each other. And the way they died would suggest that they had ingested something. The dog had started losing hair. One of the symptoms of thallium poisoning. Was this a rehearsal for the poisoning of the family? In this idyllic rural community, who could want this family dead? An investigation starts from the center and works out starts from the home and works out. Alturas is a very small community, a few hundred people. We started narrowing those people down too. I think interviewed every single person that lived in Alturas. No one in the community seems to have a motive. Police often turn to FBI profilers for insight. Mark Young has dealt with numerous cases of poisoning. The poisoner often feels like uh, that they've been wronged and wants to correct what they perceive as, as something that's been done to them or ha is aggravating them. The complexity of the crime helps narrow down the suspect list. The type of poison used was, was not something that you just go buy off the store shelf. So there's some level of criminal sophistication. Coca-Cola agreed to do some testing for the sheriff's department. There's only four, I think, thallium salts, and they introduced each of them into Coca-Cola and only one of them would not discolor the product or make it bubble out of there faster than you could get the cap back on, and that was thallium one nitrate, and that's exactly what we found. That tells you that you're dealing with somebody that uh, has a high intelligence level. Whoever concocted this toxic cocktail knew what they were doing. As the investigation unfolds, Duane and his stepbrother are gradually recovering but Peggy remains in a coma, barely clinging to life. I remember me thinking and hoping, you know, everybody tells you, uh, she can hear you talk to her, she can hear you. The doctors have a difficult conversation with the family. That it had um, progressed to the point that uh, she wasn't going to survive. She's not coming back, she's brain dead. It was time to take her off of life support. It wasn't her, she wasn't there anymore. We stood there by mom's bed. We kind of took a few minutes to say uh, goodbye. They uh, said that you're gonna see her lungs inflate and deflate, you know, quite a few times, and then, uh, and then that's it. That's what happened, and she was gone. The car poisoning is now a homicide, but police still haven't identified a suspect capable of committing this well-orchestrated murder. To murder somebody by poisoning is exceptionally rare. It is something that has to be thought up in a very demented mind by a very brilliant person who thinks that they're smarter than everyone else. Police keep interviewing the locals and finally connect with the folks that live a heartbeat away from the cars, George Trapal and his wife, Diana. They discover there had been several confrontations between the neighbors over music played too loudly by the car teenagers. He comes around and, you know, uh, comes around the fence and, uh, I want to speak to your mother, I want to speak to your mother. And they had words, they weren't kind words. and. Peggy Carr tried to be conciliatory. Sorry, it's a little bit too loud. I'll tell him to turn it down. It won't happen again. 
He just ranting and raving and cursing. And he even threatened to report the cars for renovating without a permit. We're going to turn you in. We're going to turn you in. Peggy had tried to be a peacemaker. Told us, you know, we have to live beside this man. He's not going nowhere. We're not going nowhere. We have to befriend this man. We cannot, you know, it's getting worse and worse and worse. The houses were very close together, so I'm sure that they could easily hear the music. There were just things that most neighbors encounter, really. Although the dispute doesn't seem like a strong enough motive, the proximity of the houses would give George Trapal easy access to the car home. There's nobody else around. I mean, it's just those two houses and then there's nothing. People tend to notice strangers and under intense police investigation, those details come out. And that stranger identification did not happen in this case. That tells us that the offender must be somebody that lives nearby. But who would ever suspect a poisoning over a neighborhood disturbance, over some kids playing a television or a radio too loud? Police interview George at his home. He tells them he doesn't know anything about chemistry or thallium. When they ask him why someone would poison the cars, he immediately states, perhaps to get them to move. The same message contained in the threatening note. Coincidence or something more? In Polk County, Florida, police scramble to find the person who killed Peggy Carr with poison. The 41-year-old mother drank an innocent-looking bottle of Coke, but it was laced with a rare and deadly chemical, thallium nitrate. Peggy Carr suffered for months and months. While searching for the killer, police discovered that there was bad blood between the cars and their neighbor, George Trapal. We knew that he had a high IQ. We knew that he was a member of the Mensa Society. An exclusive social group for people who score 98% or higher on an intelligence test, which fits the FBI's profile of the offender. The more of that planning, the more of that sophistication you see, the higher you might think that this person's intelligence level is. You might also believe that this person has some type of grudge that, that would have, um, the, the word I like to use is leaked somewhere in previous encounters with these people and even other people. Trapal is a software developer who claims to know nothing about chemistry, but that turns out to be a lie. We did a background on George Trapal, and we knew that he was a chemist. George Trapal knew chemistry all right, a skill he used to make illegal drugs. George was involved in a methamphetamine ring in the 70s, and we found out that he was ultimately arrested for that. There's one chemical this ex-con used extensively, thallium. It's considered a byproduct of a methamphetamine manufacturer. And while serving a few years in prison, George actually taught chemistry to other inmates. But investigators are a long way from proving George Trapal is their poisoner. When you have a good feeling that a person is, is responsible for a crime, you can't take that to court. More information was needed to pinpoint this as the right person. Police solve many homicides through interrogation, but decide that approach won't work in this case. Trapel was an intelligent person and, and an egotistical person and felt that he was smarter than the police. Grabbing a guy like that and bringing him in will only make him shut down. We also knew that he was introverted, that he was very quiet that he was not confrontational. Not the kind of person that's going to go man to man and speak to somebody. So you begin to look at uh, that poisoner as kind of a sneaky type of person. Can police outsmart the brilliant Trapal with their own cunning plan? This was not a traditional murder, so we had to use non-traditional investigative techniques. They bring in seasoned detective Susan Gorick of Special Investigations to run surveillance. I started looking through his trash. We were looking for any type of evidence that he may have discarded and possibly um, something about um, some type of chemical purchase. Day after day, Susan and her team observed George, hoping to gather evidence. And I was told to be careful because the person had a photographic memory. So if he saw us, that he could remember our cars or our faces. But nothing incriminating is found. Police fear that a suspected killer may go free. Who would if he had poisoned next? More than three months after the poisoning death of his mother, Peggy's son Alan has no answers. Overwhelmed by grief, he returns to the Navy. I didn't take it well. 
I got depressed. I got angry. I just, I couldn't handle it. Everybody's been poisoned. He's away, he can't do nothing. You know, he can't be the hero and, and you know, try to, to save us or find out what's going on. And Took all three of those bottles of Tylenol, climbed in my bunk and um, went to sleep, hoping that, uh, um, you know, that I wouldn't wake up and that it would be over. At some point, someone found out what I'd done and um, I, I woke up in the, uh, in the Navy hospital. The poisoning at the Carr household almost claimed another life and the killer is still at large. The police decide to take a radical approach, an undercover investigation. And that's where Susan came in. Detective Gorick has a wealth of experience as an undercover cop, but there's a heightened risk in assigning her to the operation. I'd been watching him for months, and I was scared to death that he had seen me and would all of a sudden put two and two together and realize who I was. We had to get information, so we chose who we thought would be the best undercover operative, and it was Susan. An opportunity arises to introduce Detective Gorick into George's world through his affiliation with Mensa, an organization for people with genius IQs. George Trapal and his wife were hosting Mensa Murder Mystery Weekend, and it was going to be a three-day event where they would simulate murders for the weekend and people could solve them. Detective Gorick develops an alias that will appeal to George Trapal. So we had studied his personality through the FBI with their behavioral scientist. Possibly this person has got some amount of uh, social inadequacy or cowardice, that type of thing. Since Mr. Trapal and his wife had a relationship where she appeared to be the more dominant one, the profiler suggested that I play up to Mr. Trapal's ego. Detective Gorick transforms herself into Texan divorcee Sherry Gwynn. The personality I developed for Sherry Gwynn was that of a victim, one going through a bad marriage. I wore different clothing than I normally would and a lot of costume jewelry. On a warm Florida day, Detective Gorick makes her way to the hotel hosting the event. I went into to register for the weekend, and the first person I saw when I walked in was George Trapal. Detective Gorick is now face to face with a suspected killer. The biggest fear that I had was that he had seen me when I was doing surveillance. I really took a deep breath and thought, has he seen me? And I looked for any recognition in his eyes. What will Trapal do if he recognizes Detective Gorick? In Polk County, Florida, George Trapal, a member of the high IQ group Mensa, is suspected of poisoning his neighbors, the Carr family, killing the mother Peggy. Four months into the investigation, police have launched an undercover investigation focusing on their prime suspect. We had to work into an environment where we could befriend him or create a relationship. Detective Susan Gorick has gone undercover to attend a murder mystery weekend hosted by George and his wife Diana. The first person she sees is George Trapal. The biggest fear that I had was that he had seen me when I was doing surveillance. I told him who I was, Sherry Gwynn, and that I needed to register. But George Trapal shows no sign of recognizing Gorick, AKA Sherry Gwynn. He handed me the registration package. Detective Gorick discovers that she has to juggle yet another identity, the character she's playing in the murder mystery. The name that he had assigned me was Roberta Putnam, a socialite from San Cristobal that dabbled in voodoo. Drinks are served and the game is on. There was over 40 people there. Participants are dressed up for their roles, everything from priests to CIA agents. There was a hooker, there was a voodoo priestess. George warms up the crowd with some jokes. He got up and told jokes about attorneys, and they were not flattering jokes. George really hated attorneys. Gorick hones in on George and puts this information to use. When he asked me about my background, I told him that my husband was a lawyer from Houston, Texas, and that I had left him and moved here. 
Will George buy her story? Talked about how he knew someone was lying by the way that their neck muscles moved. It made me very nervous. I kept talking and hoping that he wasn't using me as a test subject. To Gorick's relief, she seems to be connecting with George. He had a lot of ideas, and I just let him talk, and I played up to them. Suddenly, an announcement. The weekend's first make-believe murder has been discovered. It rather caught me off guard. And it's a poisoning. In staging this scenario for the game, was George Trapal drawing on personal experience? I found out that there had been a threatening note, and immediately my ears perked up because a threatening note. A background to the case written by George is even more chilling. One of the paragraphs that he wrote in this report said, when a death threat appears on the doorstep, prudent people throw out all their food and watch what they eat. Most items on the doorstep are just a neighbor's way of saying, I don't like you, move or else. The words are eerily similar to those in the threatening notes sent to the cars just before they were poisoned. When he talked about putting poison on a neighbor's doorstep, it, it really gave me chills. Gorick feels certain they're on the right track. After I read that, I knew that it was just not coincidence. Before the weekend wraps up, Detective Gorick has one last chat with George and his wife, Diana, a doctor, and gains valuable information. George said that they were thinking about moving his wife's practice and that they would be selling their house. The detective seizes the opportunity. I told him that I was going to be looking for a house because my husband said he would buy me a house in our divorce settlement. George invites her to swing by for a visit. After I talked to my supervisors, they immediately wanted me to follow up. At a murder mystery weekend in Florida, Detective Susan Gorick has gone undercover in hopes of capturing a real killer. George Trapal, suspected of poisoning his neighbor Peggy Carr, has created a murder scenario for the game. Detective Gorick sees an uncanny parallel between the make-believe murder and the real-life crime she's investigating. When he talked about putting poison on a neighbor's doorstep, it really gave me chills. In her guise as Sherry Gwynn, a Texan divorcee, Detective Gorick has gained access to George's home. He's planning to sell, and she says she's in the market. Detective Gorick is hunting, but not for a house. Maybe he'd open a closet and I'd see lab equipment or maybe some chemicals or something that would give us enough evidence to get a search warrant for the house. Detective Gorick is alert for anything unusual. He did show me a small secret passageway that he had built into the library. Upstairs, he did have a mannequin that had some I believe some bondage type things. Strange, but not grounds for a search warrant. It seems this mission is a bust. When I left the house, I thought that was going to be the end of the undercover role. But to Gorick's surprise, her bosses want to continue the covert investigation to see what else she can learn about George. FBI profiler Mark Young knows what's at stake. This type of person, if they really and truly develop a bond, if they feel that person is worthy, they might want to let them know about the crime. One time I met him at a park to have a picnic. She plays up the recent divorce of her alias, Sherry. I told him I just wanted to talk about my soon-to-be ex-husband. George is full of devious plans for revenge. One of the ideas he gave me was to ruin my husband's reputation because he was an attorney and send a letter saying that he molested a child. Over the next few months, Gorick, AKA Sherry, has a series of lunch dates with George. Susan had to work into an environment where she could create communication, where she could create a bond, a friendship, in order to have any communications with him at all. George shares some surprising stories. He had told me about a road trip. They'd take Oreo cookies along the way, but they would pick up hitchhikers and feed them the cookies and there was hallucinogens in them, and they would watch the people hallucinate. While Susan is in the company of this nefarious prankster, a surveillance team monitors his every move. It was high stress every second for all of us, but it was certainly 
more high stress for her. I believe she was in great peril of uh, having her food or drink poisoned. Every time I left the table and came back, I would never eat or drink anything else. It's not someone that is aggressive and just shoots someone or stabs someone. They want to sit from afar and watch someone suffer. The longer you're next to somebody that is that dangerous, the, the more danger it is uh, to you. Before I would meet George Trapal, I'd have to go over in my head over and over and over again everything that I had told him. She has to live that role. That took a lot of mental gymnastics to go through. Your life could depend on you remembering everything. It's coming up a year since the Carr family was poisoned, but Detective Gorick hasn't had a break in the case. You may have many, many pieces of small evidence, but if you don't have the whole picture, you may not convict them. Some of the higher-ups are questioning the value of the undercover operation. Any type of law enforcement agency has budget problems, so certainly it was causing problems because they needed the personnel other, other places. So they had to be convinced why it was necessary to keep going. Just as her department is about to pull the plug, Detective Gorick learns that George and his wife are finally moving, months after she had originally viewed their home. She'd already moved her practice down to Sebring. So far, investigators haven't been able to examine George's house for evidence. There was not a search warrant issued earlier uh, because we didn't believe, we being the state attorney's office, that probable cause existed to get the search warrant. Susan Gorick has an idea that will get investigators into the home. In her undercover guise as Sherry Gwynn, she contacts George and asks if she can become his tenant. He said that was fine. In fact, he and his wife had already discussed it. And I sent him a rent check. As soon as Trapal deposits the check, Gorick has legal authority over the property. A team of detectives and FBI agents swarm the house. I took our crime scene section so that they could take swabbings from everywhere in the house. They're seeking any trace of thallium nitrate, the poison used to kill Peggy Carr. We immediately went there and searched everything, took all kinds of tests. Maybe he poured it down a drain, or maybe there would be some in the air conditioner. Some little things that they had picked up and it looked like they maybe they had some residue in it. Could the residue found in various bottles be thallium? What we were hoping was that in a few weeks we would get the results back. But Detective Gorick will have to wait much longer. We found out that there had been a federal bombing case, and the FBI, their priority right then was working on that case. With the clock ticking, Gorick decides to turn up the heat on George. I had George meet me at a um, little picnic area behind a McDonald's in Sebring. Surveillance video captures their meeting. How are you? Fine. How's your world going? Well, not real good, and I need to talk to you now. Okay. I told him that I had had two detectives come and talk to me when I moved into his house. I think you neglected to tell me something. Oh, what's that? And I said that something happened in your neighborhood. Oh, oh yeah, somebody got poisoned next door. Federal. That might not be a lot to you, but it's a lot to me. Oh. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> and he said he never caught the person that did it, and it, it really frightened me. He was being very flippant about it. Susan hands him business cards she says the detectives left behind. So I talked about the detectives that had come to talk to me and that they were trying to find him, and he started getting extremely nervous. Okay, you seems to be really interested in me. I really don't know what's going on. Now, something just isn't following you, please, here. I hope I'm not a prime suspect. <laughs> that could be messy. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> and I knew right then. There was no doubt anywhere that he's the one that did it. Gorick is certain about George. But as George also drawn some conclusions about Gorick, he asks her more than once to come back to his new house in Sebring with him. So if you want a grand tour of the house. Detective Gorick feels she's close to snaring George. She has no idea George has a similar plan for her.
Detective Susan Gorick has spent the last year leading a double life. Her undercover persona, Sherry Gwynn, has befriended suspected killer George Trapal at considerable risk to herself. People like George, they don't get mad, they get even. At Detective Gorick's last meeting with George, he asked her repeatedly to come back to his house. So do you want a grand tour of the house? I'll be happy to give this guy too. Has he realized his friend Sherry is actually a cop? Take a rain check on it. That rain check may have just saved Detective Gorick from a horrible fate. Susan could have very well been his next murder victim. But after 18 months of investigation, prosecutor John Aguero knows they still don't have a solid case. We just didn't feel there was enough to arrest him and successfully prosecute him. Gorick's last hope is that a vial recovered from the suspect's home will test positive for thallium, the poison used to kill Peggy Carr. I had really not concentrated on that at all because I knew, you know, it's like a needle in a haystack. After three long months, the FBI calls with the lab results. He said, Susan, they found thallium in it. I thought he was just kidding me. And he said, yes, they found thallium. I was just elated. Early the next morning, police descend on the Trapal residence in Sebring with a warrant for George's arrest. I was still not allowed to come out from being undercover. I had him on the phone while law enforcement knocked on the front door and spoke to his wife. FBI. He told me, oh, well, by coincidence, law enforcement's here. But I remember him saying, if you'll give me a few minutes, I have to put something on. Trapal's wife is taken for questioning, but she is not charged. Our investigation did not show Mr. Trapal's wife had knowledge of the crime. Authorities searched Trapal's new residence in Sebring. He had a set of very tiny screwdrivers, like jeweler's screwdrivers. We knew that the bottle caps had been pried off very carefully using a small tool. Those tool marks fit perfectly with one screwdriver that was missing in the jeweler screwdriver set. They had a poisoning guide. It told how to poison someone with thallium and what would happen to the body. They even find a reference in George's journal to getting rid of the neighbors. We found chemicals and chemicals and chemicals at George's house. Police look for a hidden room like the one in George's Alturas home. And finally, my lieutenant found a pegboard that had tools hanging on it and found a wall behind it with a door. Looked like a door to a dungeon out of a Boris Karloff movie. And he opened the door and it was shocking. There was no inside door handle and it was a freshly painted room. The only window in the soundproof space has been sealed. And there was a platform bed and at the bottom of the bed were wood stirrups. He was building a bed on which to torture people. I, I was so shocked. He even had a pulley system to lift people. So do you want a grand tour of the house? You want a grand tour of the house? You want a grand tour of the house? Detective Gorick got very weak in the knees and just had to be taken outside. And I was so glad that I had not gone they might have not found me. She just saw herself as being the person George had built that for. It was very creepy, very creepy. Nine months after his arrest, George Trapal stands trial for the murder of Peggy Carr and the poisoning of her family. I called him the most diabolical criminal I had ever seen, thought that he had figured out the perfect crime and it almost worked. After four hours of deliberation, the jury returns a verdict, guilty on all counts. George Trapal is sentenced to death. He might have had a higher IQ than most of the world, but he certainly wasn't smarter than Susan. I was relieved because the family needed closure. Detective Gorick's work is recognized with the International Homicide Investigators Association Award for Excellence. She put her life at risk just to, you know, bring somebody's killer to justice, and I think she's awesome. Today, George Trapal continues to sit on death row. A model prisoner, George has had only one complaint, 
In a letter to the prison, he stated that the other inmates were playing their radios too loud. <laughs> 